top two friends. Uh, thank you very much, Krishna, for uh, brief and uh, pointed introduction. Uh, I was wondering that uh, Krishna had just started talking about uh, my topic. So what would I say? Uh, because uh, these are the topics uh, which are very much discussed. So when we want to speak uh, something about this topic, there is a possibility of a repetition also. Uh, actually, uh, by introducing club like conclusion and uh, newsletter like harmony, uh, we are contributing a lot to the university. And uh, this is a kind of doing something on ground level. Uh, we are different from other departments uh, because we don't believe in a kind of advertisement and a kind of uh, high life. But uh, we want to do real business. We want to meet academics. And uh, in this continuation, I have always uh, uh, requested the book club members that whenever you don't find any speaker, uh, please uh, ask me, I am always ready. Right. So, actually, this is the topic which interests me most. And uh, not only me, this is the topic which interests all of you. And uh, we can include the whole cosmos into this uh, dialectic. These terms are dialectic, and uh, they appear to be dialectic. But there is a kind of uh, understanding between uh, classicism and romanticism, right? So, in the preparation of this slide, I want to uh, thank one of our scholars, Prabhat Kumar, uh, who had directly uh, helped in, pre in preparing this slide. And uh, he suffered a lot due to me because uh, when I was supplying material to him, I was just working like a romantic person. Because there was no limitation of time and space. Maybe he got some slide in the midnight. Right. And, uh, uh, but the material that I supplied, I hope it would be a kind of classical sort of material. Uh, because it is well measured and it is well calculated. So, I am really thankful to my uh, a scholarly audience. Uh, dear audience, uh, who in this scorching heat a spare time to be uh, with us. So you are really thankful because these days who care for lecture, right? And especially this kind of intellectual lecture in India where everybody is busy with election 24, right? In this situation, if we are talking about uh, romanticism and classicism, this is something really appreciable and uh, I know that uh, the organizers of this book club are very wise. They are wiser than me, uh, especially Krishna, because he had uh, just put on some uh, symbol of which government will like, right? Like uh, 75th year of India's independence, and uh, of course, uh, something like this. G20, so he's a. Tapas has. Yeah. So, Krishna and his team, Tapas also, so they are wiser than me, right? So, I am safe due to them in the eyes of government also, right? But anyway, I don't fear anybody when I talk about uh, classicism and romanticism, right? So, uh, on the back side of this poster, you see uh, there is a picture by a painter, French painter, Travis de Villiers. Uh, uh, from the picture you can see, uh, of course this is of course this is the picture of yeah. So on the next slide, on the right side you see the picture. It is the painting by the French painter Travis de Villiers, uh, who describes the painting in which literary critics are removing the passage from books that displeased them. So it had been a tradition among writers that they just uh, remove the passage which they don't like. 
it is like us. We just uh, delete the passage, we remove the passage which we don't like. And sometimes we remove the people whom, whom we don't like from the mind also. Right? But my suggestion is uh, don't be prejudiced. Right? Because I believe there is a soul of goodness in King Seven. Right? So let us try to uh, transform the system rather than withdrawing from the system. Right? So, if you want to clean the muddy water, you have to enter into the water, right? So, this picture is very suggestive and uh, I thank again Prabhat who has got a keen, you know, uh, interest in this kind of topic. So, my presentation is focused on the discussions how classicism and romanticism inform creative process. The second point that I am going to discuss is uh, how the classicism and the romanticism are indispensable, means they cannot be separated. The third point I would like to discuss is that uh, most of the time you may have experienced when you are reading great poem or great play or great novel, uh, both the theories classicism and romanticism overlap and interface. Means there is a kind of interaction between the two. It is very difficult to identify. It is not, it is not like allopathy uh, uh, that how would you dissect one from the other. And finally, uh, the presentation sums up that uh, it is the interpenetration of both classicism and romanticism that is the soul of great works of art. So every great work of art, if you look at epics, if you look at great drama, if you look at great novel, if you look at great poem, you find there is interpenetration, there is a kind of harmony between the two. There is no quarrel, there is no dispute. So it is very interesting to know so, when we talk about uh, classicism, it is very difficult to trace its actual origin uh, because if you remember my lecture on Renaissance, I was talking uh, that uh, the Aboriginal people, the first man in the forest, he was most innovative and he had ideas regarding how to make fire, how to make weed, and how Aboriginal people in the forest they enjoy the beauty of nature. So informally we find uh, classicism and romanticism they started much before it was documented, it was recorded, it was discussed by critics and writers. But because we are researchers so we need data and we need documentation. So, for documentation, what we find that uh, classicism goes back to 4th to 5th century BC. And uh, the original classicists, uh, we relate to Homer. Everybody knows about Homer. He was the writer who wrote the, the European model. He wrote the greatest epics of the world, Iliad and Odyssey. Right. And uh, about Iliad and Odyssey, there are so many uh, smaller pieces you may have read. There is a quote by W. H. Auden, The Shield of Achilles. Right. And there is a quote by W. Beats, Leda and Swan. So there are many uh, smaller pieces which talk about it. And Plato, you know, Plato was the teacher of Aristotle and he was student of Socrates. And Plato, you know, uh, he is known for uh, Republic, he is known for dialogue. And uh, Plato, you know, uh, he was the writer who denounced poets and artists. And he said, uh, if I become the Prime Minister of Athens, I would banish all the poets and artists. And I would allow only philosophers. Because for poets, philosophers and politicians, 
they talk about religion they talk about rational they don't they don't talk about emotion and uh, after plato uh, we find sophocles about he to know he the writer who is known for oedipus oedipus rex and uh, is very important aeschylus is the father of tragedy and he is known for writing a great tragedy agamemnon and uh, of course aristotle i have sought list with some of classicists and we know aristotle because it is aristotle is a you know encyclopedia if you ask who is father of biology aristotle is the father of biology if you ask who was the first western critic who talks about politics he was aristotle so aristotle wrote a book politics and i always tell my students that uh, when plato was denouncing poets and artists aristotle was student of academy founded by plato and aristotle did not you know he condemned his teacher he was listening very patiently and when he grew up he wrote a great classic that is poetics and in poetics he defends poets and poetry plato said uh, poetry is twice removed from reality it is mother of lie but aristotle said uh, poetry is the highest kind of genre and uh, poetry is more philosophical than history and uh, aristotle gives greatest importance to poets and we know aristotle gives a kind of classification of literature and for aristotle drama is the highest kind of literature and that's why shakespeare is considered to be the greatest writer of the world if somebody ask you how can you say shakespeare is the greatest playwright of the world greatest poet of the world the answer is aristotle first for the first time in poetics he wrote that uh, drama is the highest kind of genre and epic is the second highest kind of genre and fable and novel came later that is the tertiary kind of genre so that is the answer you can give to people and audience right and of course aristotle talks about plot he talks about character there are six elements of tragedy so what is important about aristotle aristotle talks about unities he talks about unity of time place and action he talks about form he talks about classicism so uh, basically a uh, critical uh, plato was the first critic who talks about classicism now krishna was just uh, trying to uh, give some characteristics of classicism what is classicism class the what is class we say he is world class artist so class shows a kind of eminence class shows uh, i i differ with krishna that it shows something aristocratic class means something that is a standard that is elegant that is sophisticated a person who belongs to low caste or low class and if he becomes ias and if he joins the company of uh great writers or club like profusion uh he become classical because class means something that is hard class means something that is grand class means something that is uh of a standard which no no ordinary people can share right so plato talks about it but for plato there is a limitation of, of classicism because plato thinks that uh, the book the idea the ideology which enlightens religion which enlightens intellect which talks about logic and intellect is called classicism and uh, for plato poets are the greatest liars because poets do not talk about religion according to plato right but we know how much plato is correct because we have so many you know theories so many principles 
so many test tool methods by which we can criticize Plato. Later, Aristotle made it famous in his great work, Politics, that I have just discussed with you. Now, uh, from Greek, when we enter the Rome, the Italy, in Italy we find there was a golden age and that was Augustan age. If you read the poem by Alexander Pope, I think you have read the poem by Alexander Pope, The Rape of the Law, essay on criticism, and you find uh, the age of Pope is also called Augustan age. Right. So, this age is after the Roman age, the Augustan age, when King Augustus was the king of Rome. And uh, perhaps the calendar August is named after him. Right. Uh, we are not talking against uh, Hindu philosophy uh, because uh, there is a question because we talk about uh, uh, what's Pratipada and New Year. So they may find that, find us that why are you talking about Augustus? But I am sharing information with you. So in Augustan age, we find the great writers of Rome and they are classicists. The writer like Virgil, writer like Horace, writer like Ovid. About Horace we know, Horace was the writer who wrote the great poem, Ars Poetica. Virgil is known for writing a great epic, Any. Ovid is known for writing a great work, Metamorphosis. And in absurd theater, there is a writer Kafka. Kafka has just borrowed this term from Ovid and he has written a story, uh, Metamorphosis. So I want everybody to read their story, right? And uh, from them, we have another great uh, group of writers like Dante. About Dante, everybody knows. He is the writer who created a great epic poem, The Divine Comedy, right? We have writer like Petrarch. So, Petrarch is known for introducing a new kind of genre and that is sonnet writing. Sonnet was just uh, imported into England from Petrarch and Leonardo da Vinci. I have selected a few writers only, the rest will lie in discussion. Leonardo da Vinci, you know, he was a writer, he was a painter who created uh, immortal painting of Mona Lisa, right? And you see, how perfect, how perfectly imperfect the painting of Mona Lisa is. That even today, if you talk about modern lovers, the smile of the modern beloved will, will fade, but Mona Lisa will smile. She is smiling even today. Because the smile that is created. Yeah. You do a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, so, uh, but finally I am successful, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the painting of Mona Lisa is still a wonder a stroke of artist's mind. And if you remember, Mona Lisa has become a simile today. It has become a metaphor today. And if you remember, T.S. Eliot, when he was writing about Hamlet, I always told you that for, Ham uh, for Eliot, Hamlet is artistic failure. But you know, Eliot begins with this remark that Hamlet is Mona Lisa of all literature. Right? So if you want to confuse people, you say you are Mona Lisa. Right? So Mona Lisa is a symbol of confusion also. Right? And this is the beauty of art when you are always inviting confusion. Right? And suspense. Right? So when we enter Horace Ars Poetica, I tell you that uh, Ars Poetica, it has been appreciated by many critics of modern time, especially the American critic, Maglish. And if you remember Maglish, American critic and poet, he has said, Ars Poetica is the milestone for writers today, for poets today. Because Ars Poetica is the first book which guides us how to create poem and how to write poem. 
it is from Horace that uh, Sydney, the great Renaissance critic, learned that uh, the purpose of literature is to unite both instruction and pleasure. So Horace talks about it for the first time in Ars Poetica. And uh, Horace is very important. I want everybody to read Horace, right? He has written something very great. Now, uh, in English literature, uh, because they are primarily we are students of English literature and especially British literature, we find that classicism is traced to uh, works of Ben Johnson, Dryden, Edison, Swift, Poe, Dr. Johnson, T. S. Eliot, F. R. Lewis, T. T. C. So, Ben Johnson, you know, he was the writer who talked about classicism only. And he was anti-romantic. If you read the prologue to every man in his humor, he is talking about satire, he is talking about wit, he is talking about irony, he is talking about religion. And he said that I have nothing to do with romanticism. I am here to correct the folly of people. I am here to rectify the errors of people. And I am going to just make the society better. So, Ben Johnson was a great classicist. Dryden, about Dryden you know, that Dryden was, is the father of English criticism. Because Dryden was the first critic who talks about what is the function of criticism in literature. If you read his great work, An Essay on Dramatic Poetry, right, I think everybody has gone through it. And those who are going to pass out, they must study An Essay on Dramatic Poetry. Right, this is very important. And uh, Dryden, you know, uh, of course he is a classicist, but he is equally, you know, inclined to romanticism. And uh, Dryden admires Shakespeare most. He compares Shakespeare with Ben Johnson. And he says, when I read both these uh, great playwrights, I find Shakespeare is more witty than jo Shakespeare is more witty. Johnson talks about pattern. Johnson talks about correctness. But Shakespeare talks about uh, something that relates to soul. Something that relates to human mind. Something that relates to human mystery. So, he says, I admire Ben Johnson, but I love Shakespeare. So, everybody admires classicism, but everybody loves romanticism. This is quite natural. I understand the heat, but what can I do? <laughs> right. And uh, if you come to Edison, Swift and Pope, Edison, Swift, of course, they are classical writers, and they are talking about uh, form, they are talking about uh, order, they are talking about uh, a technique. So, what is classicism? Classicism is a kind of writing, a kind of theory, which talks about form, which talks about material, which talks about common sense, which talks about religion, which talks about rationality, which talks about intellect, which talks about logic. Right? So, Pope, if you read Pope, he was a very intelligent person, you remember the rape of the law. Right? So, where did the Pope get this title from? The rape of the law. He was reading Homer. And in Iliad, you know, uh, there was a rape of Helen. Rape means something that is immoral, something that is inhuman. And whatever Helen was doing, it was something against morality of the time. Right? She eloped with the, the Prince of Troy, Paris. So, this kind of thing. So, he borrowed the title from Homer. And he gave the title, The Rape of the Law. Because the law was cut by Lord Pitre in a party. And you know, Alexander Pope was the poet laureate in the court of Queen Anne. Right? So he intervened and he said, in order to just stop the quarrel between the lady Arabella, and he did not present Arabella directly. He gave another name to Arabella, that is Belinda. Belinda was the name given to her. Right. 
and you know so hope gives a kind of more heroic structure to the whole uh, chaos the whole crisis and uh, belinda has been presented like helen she has been presented like you know the great heroine it was a parody kind of poem and that's why it is called more heroic poem right and you remember there is a line from the rape of the law belinda has smiled and all the world was gay belinda hansi or sari duniya hansi aise khatarnak hansi thi uski iska hindi translation maine kiya right so what an exaggeration you know hope was simultaneously a classicist but at the same time he was being romantic also because in english it is called neo classicism why neo classicism because we had already classicism developed in greek in italy in france and from greek italy and france this classicism traveled to england in 18th century and uh, the writers of england they are trying to define classicism in their own social context so this is called neo classicism right and uh, after pope when we come to dr johnson you know about Doc, dr johnson it is very important to know uh, he was working in library and uh, you know working in library he passed masters and he become doctor and dr johnson is known for writing the first dictionary of english literature english language so i am giving you some important question also boswell wrote the first biography of dr johnson dr johnson is called the father of neo classicism this is another answer to you right so dr johnson you know shakespeare was so marvelous such a great romantic genius that when dr johnson was writing about neo classicism but he also wrote preface to shakespeare you know another book by dr johnson that is lives of the poets and uh, in lives of the poets he talks about classics he talks about uh, you know uh, dryden he talks about uh, o he talks about milton and uh, uh, he he says that pope is also a great poet and if pope is not a uh, poet uh, uh, nature poet where poetry is to be found so he was also influenced by the great uh, poetics of alexander pope and then when we come to you know uh, t s eliot about t s eliot you know so much i can deliver uh, special lectures i think 10 or 12 uh, on t s eliot so in t s on t s eliot you can ask me question and uh, t s eliot announced that i am royalist in politics classicist in literature and anglo catholic in religion that was the you know announcement of t s eliot you read his essay tradition and individual dialect you you read his essay what is classic and you find eliot is a classicist and uh, he is totally anti romantic he criticized wordsworth but i tell you one thing when eliot fell ill he did not take paracetamol he read the poem of also so eliot was sometime like indian politician who abuses in parliament but at night they celebrate party together right yeah so eliot was very intelligent yeah okay okay no no i i think i didn't change Yeah. Why are you doubting my technique? <laughs> okay, it is very classical, right? Ah, uh, this was the condition of Shakespeare uh, in uh, Renaissance age and in New Classical age. He was criticized by many, but he was loved by most, right? So he is my follower also, and uh, you know, uh, sometimes classicists and romantics drink together, right? And Shakespeare died of drinking with Ben Jonson, right? Okay, so I'm not inviting you. <laughs> yeah. So F. R. Lewis, you know, is the writer who wrote a great uh, book, The Great Tradition, right? I think some of you are familiar with the book Great Tradition. And in Great Tradition, 
uh, if her Lewis has included some great novelist of English literature uh, like Jane Austen, like George Eliot, like Joseph Conrad, like Henry James, and later he also added D. H. Lawrence, right? So uh, if her Lewis talks about tradition, and uh, tradition is very important because you are disciple of A. S. Eliot, right? So what is important is the classicism is very important in English literature. And we have seen right from Ben Johnson down to the present time, there is uh, a group of writers who are talking about classicism and uh, classical you know, discipline, classical manners, classical orders. So you know, in English literature, neoclassicism spans for almost more than a century, right from Renaissance down to the beginning of Romanticism, up to 1798 up to 1789, French Revolution. And we find many writers. And uh, in New Classicism, we also find some new terms like Enlightenment. Enlightenment was a movement in Europe. And you know, Enlightenment is a philosophy which talks about religion, which talks about, again, uh, rational, which talks about utilitarianism, Hobbes, right? Hobbes, uh, Adam Smith, Charles Darwin, and all the neoclassical writers like Alexander Pope, like uh, Dr. Johnson, like Jonathan Swift, all these writers, you know, they were talking about enlightenment. Kant, the German philosopher Kant was talking about uh, uh, enlightenment. So, these writers, the followers of enlightenment, they are basically classicists. Because they believe in society, they believe in humanity, they believe in religion. Now, the term neoclassicism, it was coined by the great German art historian J.J. Wittelmann and he coined the term. This is again information for you. It will help you to prepare for net also, right? So, because uh, Prabhat helped me, so it is a kind of mutual help to just uh, compensate the loss of uh, quiz also. So, right. So, it has something to do with it also. So, what are the characteristics? You know, rationality, balance, non-fantastical view of world and events, symmetry, follow tradition and nature. Right. They are the characteristics of neoclassicism. So, I understand Krishna is just uh, looking into my eyes. Then slides are many and time is limited. So hurry up please. Okay. So if we look at uh, the definitions and observations, we find Ben Johnson he writes something very important about classicism. That classicism is something that is current and patent. There is a kind of pattern, there is a kind of correctness about classicism. And Goethe, the great German uh, critic and philosopher of 18th century, has written something wonderful. Classicism is health and romanticism is sickness. Right. Although I don't agree with him, uh, because without romanticism there is no health. Right. Okay. Anyway. Now, it is Goethe who talked about uh, uh, Shakuntala of Abhigyan Shakuntalam that in the character of Shakuntala, we find marriage of heaven and hell. So, Goethe was a great, you know, exponent of Indian philosophy also, right. It has been character of Germans. They have loved Indian philosophy more than uh, the Indians today, right. Now, uh, uh, he says, uh, the other uh, writer like Dryden, only poetry and painting are the true imitation of nature. And we find Dr. Johnson is talking about pattern and antiquity in classicism. And Pope spoke something very important when he begins his essay on criticism, the proper study of mankind is man. Right? Know thyself, presume not God to scan the proper study of mankind is man, right? Don't intrude God into hum humanity, right? 
try to know man and you will know god right he would do shy and beautifully written uh parishte se kathin hai insa banna parishte se kathin hai insa banna isme hoti hai mehnat zyada right so it is very important to become a man then to become an apostle an angel right but it takes very hard work and honesty to become a man right so ts eliot he defining classic he writes a classic can occur only when a civilization is mature when a language and literature are mature and it must be the work of a mature mind right if you remember tradition and individual tradition right he talks about in personality and he says poetry is not turning loose of emotion it is an escape from emotion it is not an expression of personality it's an escape from personality and the more uh, the more uh, mature the artist the more perfectly different in him will be the man who suffers and the mind which creates right so it is wonderful observation and uh, so we find that classes are very important because they talk about maturity they talk about uh, a kind of you know the understanding and they are the superficial differences neo classes they are conscious and uh, romanticists they talk about a spontaneity neo classical writers they talk about art for life sake and uh, romantics they talk about art for art sake you know in 18th century france there was a movement called art for art sake it was started by victor hugo and uh, uh, and gautier and uh, simons arthur simons and from france it came to england and you find writer like oscar wilde writer like walter pater who talks about art for art sake john keats pb shelley they are the writers who belong to art for art sake and they think that the business of art is not to give morality rather art is for a kind of aesthetic pleasure it is for a joy right but uh, neo classical writers say no art and morality they are intertwined right and a writer like john ruskin writer like you know uh, william carlyle thomas carlyle sorry thomas carlyle and matthew arnold they talks about art and morality both so all great writers talk about art and morality both right so neo classicism it talks about urbanity and humanity and uh, romanticism talks about mysticism in romanticism you find there is something that is neither on sea or land right so something is strange jahan na jaye ravi wahan jaye kavi right so romantics are great people imagination is very important about romantics and i want everybody to read the book romantic imagination by c m bawra and the romantic poets by graham huff right and i also suggest you to read the book by william blake the marriage of heaven and hell this is a wonderful book of romanticism neo classicists they talk about movement in society romanticism talk, talk about escape from harsh reality so romanticism is about escape sometimes uh, because uh, romantic poets who talk about love madness about flora and fauna they talk about daffodils they talk about uh, just uh, kubla khan they talk about just building castle in the air they talk about helen if you remember dr postus was this the beast that launched out of ships and burned the topless stars of william o oh, helen made me mortal with thy kiss all is dross that is not helena right you remember what's what poem he talks about childhood and for uh, you know what's what what is the reality the contact with nature is the reality coleridge did not agree with wordsworth for what uh, for coleridge only going to nature is not the beginning of being romantic otherwise fisher man lich gatherer will be more romantic than romantic poets because they live in the life of nature every time so coleridge says it is the secondary imagination that is more important for a poet not the primary imagination which wordsworth talks about 
right so yeah we have deeper meanings we can uh, mean neoclassicism as a kind of search for refinement it is a search for loftiness it is a kind of aptness in art and literature i think you should remember longinus the great greco roman critic who talks about sublime that sublimity is the criterion of a great art and literature because sublimity means it is not right like writing ordinary things great poets always select great dictions and uh, as a uh, uh, high wind blow on high hills so great poetry always takes place in the mind of great poets so they talk about refinement refined addiction and loftiness loftiness means something that is elevating something that is majestic something that is grand if you remember john milton's paradise lost right to so remember the opening lines everybody remembers the opening line right and the students of mm previous they have learned the opening line because i gave them the one assignment learn the opening lines of paradise lost learn the opening lines of fairy queen that was the assignment can you think so you are not only you know uh, put to trial your juniors are equally put to trial right so uh, new classicism yeah romanticism is a quest for occult the mysterious and transcendental romantic writers they always talk about something mysterious they talk about something that is secret they talk about something that is transcendental if you remember american transcendentalists emerson who know walt whitman and you have seen william wordsworth if you remember the poem tinker nabe in tinker nabe wordsworth writes i have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of the setting sun right and uh, cataract and all this but this leads to a still sad music of humanity right if you remember another poem by wordsworth my heart leaps up when i behold a rainbow in the sky so was it when my life began so is it now i am a man so shall it be when, when i shall grow old or let me die the child is father of the man and i wish my days to be bound each to each by natural fire still i remember the lines uh, for last uh, my school time i remember the lines so i am different from you right because you remember your boy friend and girl friend right <laughs> and chamaran meet sometimes right uh, yeah so neo classicism it talks about beliefs and mannerisms neo classical writers and philosophers they talk about beliefs they talk about some kind of trust in tradition in ancient in past they talk about mannerism means the style is important how you write is important manner is important and that's why in restoration comedy if you remember it was a comedy of manners and uh, when johnson's comedy it was called comedy of humors right so they have given a kind of category new classical writers give a kind of category to their writing and romantic writers like oleris he talks about willing suspension of disbelief it is a phrase that is taken from chapter 14 biographia literaria right this is very important point only sage a critic asked him who oh, you are talking about uh, something unbelievable in kubla ka rhyme of ancient mariner christabel what is this you are talking about ghosts you are talking about fairies you are talking about supernatural Somebody will ask question. Why Shakespeare talks about witches and ghosts? They are the real holy saints. When you are reading literature like this, neither believe nor disbelieve. Rather, be neutral if you want to enjoy supernatural literature. Right? He wants us to suspend our disbelief, and this constitutes poetic faith for Coleridge. And neoclassicism talks about common humanity romanticism talks about mind of man because mind of man is very important for romantics now we come across some certain phrase and idioms by romantics wordsworth 
you know everything about it, the spontaneous workflow, powerful feelings, emotionally connected, intangibility, the child is father of the man, I have felt a presence, bliss of solitude. Bliss of solitude is a phrase taken from which poem? Diabodes. I never lifted a stone. This phrase is taken from my cow by Wordsworth. I still remember. Type of the wise that soars but never roam. It is taken from the Skylark by Wordsworth. Right? And uh, the line we look before and after and find for what is not. Our sweetest songs with some pain is brought. This line is taken from P.P. Shelley's poem to a Skylark. Right? To a Skylark to the Skylark. That is the difference between Wordsworth and uh, P.P. Shelley. Right? Always gave these phrases fancy and imagination. We receive but what we give. This line is taken from Coleridge's great, great poet. Uh, dejection and Ode. This is the poem. Uh, when uh, Coleridge went for honeymoon along with his wife, and uh, his wife was very excited and she was very, you know, uh, intoxicated. But Coley said, Oh lady, we receive but what we give. I don't feel so excited as you. Uh, because inner nature is very important to find beauty in outer nature. So imagine the condition of his wife who married such a romantic man, such a philosopher. So never marry a philosopher, please. Right. Especially ladies. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and drunk the milk of paradise. This is the concluding line of Kubla Khan. Right. You forgot everything because you have no time. Right. Okay. I congratulate you for your uh, happy method. Right. So drunk the milk of paradise. Can a classicist write a line like this? A classicist can never imagine. Uh, because this is the privilege of a romantic genius like Polish. Kids, you know, kids appreciated Wordsworth so much that he used this phrase and you know, kids wanted many phrases in his love letter. Who was the beloved of John Keats? Henny Brown. Who was the beloved of John Keats? Henny Brown. You must remember his beloved's name. And in, in love letter he mentioned such philosophical phrases. He wrote this because of life for Wordsworth. And he also says in one of his love letter, this world is a well of soul making. This world is a transformation. When a child is born in this world, there is a transformation of the child into a man. Well means value of soul making. Hence he cannot cheat. This line is taken from O to Nightingale. You have forgotten but I will never. Right? Beauty is truth, truth beauty. Oh, no, Gracian, a thing of beauty, joy forever, its loveliness increases, it will never pass into nothingness, it will still create a power, sweet for us, full of sweet breathings, sweet dreams, and sweet fancy. These lines are taken from Endymion. These are the opening lines of Endymion. Right? A great poem by John Keats. Right? Shall a profuse expense of unpremeditated art? This line is taken from to a skylark. Nice. If winter comes and spring be far behind, go to the west wind. Right? So P.B. Shelley is a platonic writer. He is an idealist. He talks about utopia. Right? But uh, he is always building castle in the air. But like Wordsworth, like John Keats, P.B. Shelley could not become popular. He could not become a great poet because in P.B. Shelley we find only Romanticism, there is no classicism. Right. Now, if you talk about neoclassicism, you don't think neoclassicism was only present during 18th century. I tell you one thing that. Uh, it's my history. Okay. okay. So I don't understand what is the technical flaw. I think you have done something. <laughs> he is doing something. No, no, sir. Actually, it's the time in the moment I have to answer. Oh, okay. Oh, he is trying to signal me. Very time conscious. 
Briefly discuss these terms. Actually, there was so much, but uh, due to time constraints, I am just briefing. Otherwise, you can understand my uh, my way of presentation. What are you doing? Are you watching the entire presentation? <laughs> <laughs> you are wasting my five minutes, so I I want a compensation of five minutes. <laughs> With interest, so tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you are here, so you are bonus for us. <laughs> yes. Narcissism, especially uh, if you remember the Chicago School of Critics. Uh, uh, you know, new critics, new critics, you know, uh, like Ellen Tate, like John Crow Ransom, like Cliff Brooks, like T.S. Eliot, I.A. Richards, if her Lewis. And uh, in America, there was another school of critics which is called Chicago School of Critics and they are called New Aristotelians, right? R.S. Crane, Wayne, Richard Macken, Elder Olson, they are uh, Chicago School of Critics and they talk about pluralism. So, it is a kind of variation because classicists talk about unity. They talk about singularity, but uh, there are critics, although they, they belong to classical school like New Aristotelians, Chicago School of Critics, but they, there is a variation, there is a change, and they talk about pluralism. So, they are very important. We have Russian formalists like Roman Jacobson, Bakhtin, Lautman, Victor, Slovensky. So, these Russian formalists, they are another variation of classicism uh, and uh, like new critics. Uh, because they talk about literariness, they talk about violence of language, and they talk about some kind of uh, different poetic language. So we find that classicism and romanticism, they are being uh, revised. And uh, in uh, modern times, we have a poet like W. Weeds, and if you remember, we remember W. Weeds because uh, he wrote the preface to Gitanjali by Rabindranath Tagore. And uh, uh, it's suggested they go to translate a uh, Bengali Gitanjali into English, and on his suggestion he translated it. So W. Bates, uh, he wrote very famously, "We were the last romantics," and this line is taken from his famous poem. Uh, it is Pule Park and Bolili. It is not Pule Park, sorry, Pule Park. C W O L E. So please correct it. I couldn't correct, and uh, sorry. And uh, there is another uh, critic. Uh, Frank Kermode, who talks about romantic image in modern time. Because in modern time, if you talk about romanticism, this is the great risk you are taking. Right? Uh, because in modern time, center cannot hold you, remember the blue weeds. So, Frank Kermode says, the artist in isolation and emerging power of imagination, enlightenment has seldom been so, so enjoyable. So, enlightenment of classicism didn't Please, people, it has nothing like you know great joy. So, a romantic imagination is something that uh, gives a kind of isolation to artists. It gives a kind of meditation to artists. It gives a kind of solitude to the artist for creation, right? And great works. If you read Blake, Song of Innocence, Song of Experience, great elegy written in country churchyard, mm -hmm. Dryden's and his own dramatic poetry. Johnson's preface to Shakespeare, these works, they contain both neoclassical and romantic elements. And that's why Dryden, although he was born in neoclassical age, but he's called liberal classicist. He talks about romanticism. He loves Shakespeare. And they, uh, Dr. Johnson also wrote preface to Shakespeare. And uh, he speaks in favor of Shakespeare's violation of humanities. And uh, finally, I'm coming to last Great writings, you know, if you look at great writers like Shakespeare, like Wordsworth, like Milton, all these writers, you know, they are talking about uh, fusion of classicism and romanticism. At this juncture, there are so many things, but uh, one critic I want to share with you, Nietzsche. And the spelling of Nietzsche, I ask every student. For example, uh, what is the spelling of Nietzsche? N I E T Z S C H, Nietzsche. So I still remember, you also remember it, please. Okay, so Nietzsche wrote a famous book, The Birth of Tragedy, right? In The Birth of Tragedy, he talks about two Greek gods, 
Dionysian and Apollonian, right? And according to you know Nietzsche, the great writing Dionysian means a god who talks about romanticism. Apollo is a god who talks about uh, discipline. So Nietzsche says to create great work and great work of art, we have to bring about fusion. We have to bring about a kind of interaction between Dionysian and Apollonian. Both Dionysian god and Apollo god must dance together in the creation of a great work of art, right? method, I remember everything, don't worry. <laughs> so Matthew Arnold talks about touchstone method. In touchstone method, he talks about the fusion of classicism and romanticism. If you remember his poem, a scholar gypsy, right? So a scholar becomes gypsy. A scholar comes to join the gypsy tribe, right? It is something which brings the scholar to the tribe of gypsy. Wanderer people. And if you remember the great uh, Russian critic, Bakhtin, Bakhtin talks about dialogic imagination. Bakhtin talks about carnivalism. Bakhtin talks about, uh, you know, uh, polyphony. He talks about uh, joining the tribe. Joining the tribe does not mean to become aboriginal. Joining the tribe means, let us be a spontaneous. Let us be part of the common people. Right? So Bakhtin, even today they are talking about this thing. So, in modern time also, if you read any writer, so we have seen how there is interface, interaction between classicism and romanticism, and uh, there is no writer, great writer, who is at the same time not a romantic and classicist. If you are only classicist, you will be forgotten by humanity. If you are only romantic, nobody will have time to read you, because you will waste his time. But if you are a great artist, because some of you are writers also, I know. If you are a writer, if you are going to be a writer, you have to bring about delicate balance between region and emotion because Eliot also talks about unified sensibility, which is very, very important. Right? So to sum up, because I see the, the red signal, Krishna. Yeah. So I, I, I see the red signal, Krishna. So I find... Uh, that every great work of art is a beautiful marriage between classicism and romanticism. So, I wish all of you to be both. I wish all of you to bring about a marriage of both classicism and romanticism in life. If you want to be a happy man, if you want to be a successful man, if you want to be a prosperous man, if you want to be a blessed man, if you want to be an immortal man, thank you very much. Thank you.